to another MetroVision Idea Exchange. Um, we're, today we're featuring a webinar with the panelists uh, that have all taken part in uh, ULI's technical advisory panels. Um, I'm Andy Taylor. I'm planning manager here at the Denver Regional Council of Governments. Just to let you know, um, myself and Derek Webb from uh, the Denver Regional Council of Governments. We will be monitoring your questions throughout the webinar. Uh, so please feel free to take use of the control panel for GoToWebinar to ask questions at any time. And we will have a Q&A session at the end uh, of all the panelists' presentations. Uh, to kick us off, I've just got a couple announcements um, that I'll get through here quickly and get on to the presentation. For those who are seeking uh, AICP credits, uh, they are available for live attendees. Uh, the key number to search for uh, at the APA website is 919-4528. Um, that's the ID for this session. Another announcement is that we now have a, a great new MetroVision website, metrovision.drcog.org. It's a great way to keep up on events like these and other opportunities and other resources uh, at Dr. Cog and throughout the region. Uh, one of the announcements that's up on that website right now uh, is about the Colorado Growing Water Smart opportunity. Uh, this is a workshop that is put on through the Sonoran Institute. Um, many costs are um, made uh, available through, uh, are covered by the Sonoran Institute. Um, the deadline to apply for local governments to put together a team uh, that can go through this workshop uh, is February 14th. Uh, the link on the screen provides more details for those interested. Uh, one of the most uh, uh, relevant announcements to make for this uh, webinar uh, is that we have a request for applications out uh, with the Urban Land Institute, um, specifically about what you, the topic you're about to hear about, technical advisory panels. Uh, through Dr. Cog's support, um, we were able to reduce the cost to two communities to put on a technical advisory panel. Uh, so you can find more details about how to apply uh, by February 28th uh, at the link shown on the screen. Uh, there is also in the handouts pane uh, through GoToWebinar, you can also download uh, the request for applications uh, directly as well as the slides that you're about to see today. And I will hand off uh, the uh, beginning uh, introductions of this panel uh, right now to uh, Marianne. Hi, everyone. Uh, we are so excited for this webinar um, to tell you a little bit more about our technical advisory panel um, program that we do throughout the state. Um, and we have this longstanding relationship with Dr. Cog to reduce the cost of TAPs, as we call them, for communities in the Dr. Cog region. So thank you for calling in, and I'm going to look forward to talking with you and discussing um, the opportunities today. So the Urban Land Institute is a global nonprofit, and our mission is to provide leadership in the responsible use of land and in creating and sustaining thriving communities worldwide. Um, so our TAFT program fits really well into that because um, we provide expert expertise um, in community revitalization work. We have, we're a membership organization. We have currently actually over 45,000 members globally. 1,400 of those are in Colorado alone. And our members really span the gamut of the real estate and land use industries. Um, we have real estate developers, but we also have design, financial, legal, professional people and um, all across different sectors, so public and private sectors. Um, we not only do um, events, we also do research, we promote best practices, we do a lot of um, educational activities in addition to our advisory service work. So what are what are TAPs? I, I began to talk about this a little bit earlier. Um, what they are is we bring in ULI members with the expertise needed into communities to help them solve challenging land use issues. Um, and that can be a lot of different things. Uh, and we work with communities to define the scope of what the panelists will be addressing. 
During the panels, um, they're usually two days long, and our members volunteer their time to provide third party professional advice um, and best practices to help those communities solve whatever their land use issue is. Um, and since 2004, in ULI Colorado alone, we've done more than um, 60 TAPs in Colorado. Um, as I mentioned, TAPs are usually around two days. Um, we do extensive advanced preparation for each TAP, um, including an advanced packet of information for the panelists so they, they know what they're getting into. Um, and then we also work with the community to develop a stakeholder list and those stakeholders will be interviewed during the TAP. Um, the panelists during the TAP will, will do a tour of the area, like you can see in this image. Um, and then they do quite a few stakeholder interviews. Um, and then they sequester to come up with third party non binding findings and recommendations that they ultimately present at the end of the TAP to all those stakeholders. And then after that final presentation, we put together a written report that the community can use in an ongoing way um, with people who might not have taken part in the actual TAP. So it'll be written in a way that, that anyone can understand what the recommendations were for the community. Um, just as I mentioned, the recommendations are non-binding. This is like getting professional advice on what these um, members think would be helpful for the community. It also is a great way to provide political cover for doing the right thing. Sometimes city staff know what should be done, but they need outside experts to say, hey, this is actually what should be done. And then elected officials um, frequently listen to that advice. Um, we also, um, sometimes we also give um, presentations to city councils or others um, when asked to. And our TAPs have a very strong record of leading to on the ground projects and solutions, um, like new policies and actual built projects. And currently, um, we're working on a 10-year impact report talking about all those um, outcomes from TAPs over the years. So we're excited about that. And as Andy mentioned, um, this year, we're offering um, to reduce the cost of a TAP from 15,000 to 10,000 for two communities. And all you have to do is apply using going to this link, or you can download the, the request for applications from the handout section and go to webinar. Um, we just ask that you apply by February 28th, but you are more than welcome to reach out to me with any questions about the program. I'm, I'm happy to help you brainstorm um, scopes or um, problem statements or questions for the panelists um, so that you have a strong application. Um, so yeah, if, if you have any questions, please let me know. And I think my contact information will also be available through this. Okay, and I, I would just like to introduce our other speakers briefly. Um, we have some amazing speakers here to, for you today. Arlene Tanawaki was the chair of two of the panels that are gonna be presented today. Um, and she's going to talk about the overarching theme of these various TAPs, which is the link between placemaking and economic development, which many of our TAPs address. So Arlene, we'll hand it over to you. Um, good morning, everyone. And so uh, Arlene Taniwaki with Arlen Land Use Economics. So what is the link between placemaking and economic development? Um, we're defining it as leveraging and creating placed assets to drive growth in community. So the old place-based economic development paradigm was essentially based on cheap. It was inexpensive land and buildings, low cost of doing business, low taxes, cheap labor. Um, in some cases, um, there was proximity to natural resources. And in a lot of cases, there was often a mismatch between jobs and workers and where they lived. So the new place-based economic development paradigm is, you know, denser. There's often a mix of uses, um, highly amenitized, walkable, collaborative, social. And we're also finding a lot of communities, in a lot of communities, that there's a strong desire for a community center or, or a gathering place. And so obviously placemaking is a very important piece of all of this. It's not just design. Um, 
it, it has been traditionally associated with planning, but this diagram from the Project for Public Spaces shows that it's got a wide variety of different attributes ranging from comfort in image, and that's basically um, it's safe, clean, and comfortable, to access and linkages, you know, can you get there? Once you're there, can you move around easily? Are there different ways of getting there? Um, uses and activities, uh, can you do a variety of different things in these locations? Can you work there, live there, uh, recreate there? And, and then finally, there's a very social aspect to all of this. Is it, do you take pride in it? Um, is it friendly, interactive, and welcoming? And so it's not just about um, great design, which is obviously a big part of it, but it's also about, is it usable and do people enjoy being there? And so um, placemaking is a, a popular public tool for um, a variety of reasons. One of them is that for a lot of cities, it's something that, you know, it's part of providing public infrastructure. It's something that they know how to do. And so the hope is that placemaking will have catalytic impacts and that there will be jobs that will be created that have spin-off benefits, multiplier impacts that, that ripple throughout the economy, um, that there might be some ancillary neighborhood redevelopment. And so that you're leveraging much more than you originally invested um, there was a national study done by uh, Smart Growth America and Chris Leinberger. They essentially looked at case studies throughout the country, and they essentially compared walkable urban spaces to drivable suburban spaces, and they found that there were pretty significant rent premiums. They, they essentially looked at office, retail, and multifamily, rental multifamily, and they found that for office and retail, there were premiums of over 100% in many cases, and for rental multifamily, you know, about 60%. And so um, we presented this diagram actually in Castle Pines to talk about the role of placemaking in sort of the toolbox of incentives. And essentially, we put it into the context of how strong is your market overall? So at the bottom of the um, graphic, it shows um, you know, a continuum of a strong market to a weak market and what appropriate tools um, might be applicable in each particular case. So in a case where the market is stronger, uh, cities can, um, and, and this is what cities do all the time, they provide infrastructure, they provide regulatory tools, zoning, and you know if those tools are properly put into place in strong markets oftentimes the markets do respond in a favorable way um place making is you know i think it's it's among your tool of incentives it's um as you're moving along the continuum it's more catalytic the idea is if you invest in place making for example the market will respond you might also have to include other regulatory and financial tools as part of that toolbox but as the market is weaker and you know sometimes it's within a sub area or a neighborhood this is where you need to in a more directed way um uh, you know, put in and put into place like TIF or urban renewal. And then in some cases where the market is really weak, you have situation where the city becomes a really active partner in redevelopment. And so um, the question then is, um, why is placemaking important? And it's partially in response to you know who is working and living in the area. So this chart shows, uh, employment growth between 2010 and 2018 in the Denver metro area. And it shows that the top Denver metro employment growth sector has really been in, you know, the knowledge industries. It's been in the professional scientific and technical services, followed pretty closely by healthcare and social assistance. So these jobs are not only higher paying jobs, but folks that tend to be in this in these sectors of employment also really value um, place and amenities and walkability. 
So the other important thing that is happening is that, and I think we all know this, is that Denver, the metro area is just very popular. Um, it's become an attractor for millennials. And so this is an excerpt from a recent article in the New York Times, um, just where they rank the best places for millennials to live and work. And as you can all see, the Denver Aurora Lakewood metro area is number one on the list. And you know we've seen a pretty significant millennial population growth in the last five years or so. And the unemployment rate is relatively low at 3%. And so, you know, this is another group, as you all know, that really values sort of, you know, community centers, places, um, you know, to hang out in. Uh, they favor collaboration. Um, so in, in terms of the Denver metro area and our overall competitive advantage, um, especially as you compare it to the rest of the country, um, the foot traffic ahead, Chris Leinberger, Smart Growth America report, um, essentially ranked the largest U.S. metro areas in terms of their walkable urban real estate, sort of, propor sort of proportional relative to the rest of the region. And um, they measured it by occupied square footage in 2018, really looking at office, retail, and rental multifamily. And, you know, Denver ranked pretty high on that list, you know, along with New York City, Boston, Washington, D.C., and the Denver and the San Francisco Bay Area. And so, um, you know, obviously changes are happening, and I think part of our charge overall is to respond and plan for some of these changes. And so, you know, as um, you all know, millennials are moving out of the center city. They're aging. Um, a lot of them are starting fat families, and so they're looking for alternative places to go. But they still value those urban attributes of place, of walkability, of community centers. And so in the um, Emerging Trends in Real Estate, the ULI report and meeting that was recently held about changes that are happening, um, there, um, at least in the document, there was a comment about suburbs are taking a chance on mixed-use, walkable, Millennial attracting development, and arguably this also applies to neighborhoods outside of the center city as well, which can benefit from some of these changes. And so, um, you know, and obviously there are challenges because what we're doing is going into existing neighborhoods, existing suburbs, um, and, and making changes overall. And sometimes these changes are are difficult. And actually, these chat the, these um, Challenges are represented by the case studies that um, we'll be talking about um, in in each of the tasks that we conducted. So in the case of South Denver, Kevin will be talking about um, a situation where there's been decades of disinvestment and decline, where assets have been undervalued. And so how do you how do you turn all of that um, around? In the case of Castle Pines, um, Sam will be talking about that. And really the challenge there has been legacy design patterns. It's a, you know, an old um, suburban community. It's very affluent, but at the same time, um, some of the patterns that have been set up really don't enhance human interaction and sociability. Um, there's, you know, parking maybe in inappropriate places. Uh, you know, the challenge obviously is, is that fixing all of this takes a lot of investment. Sometimes it's difficult or sometimes public, um, uh, maybe outcry against some of these changes overall. And then, you know, and finally in Erie, Malcolm, we're talking about the fact now, and now, now in, in um, Erie, the community is a fast growing, it's got a younger population, yet, um, and I think there's a strong desire for community, but at the same time, they're reaching out to the development community, they're wanting to do some things a little bit differently, and you have, um, you know, folks have done things in the same way for so many years, and you find a lot of times that these old patterns are very difficult to change overall. So how do you communicate all of that? And so with that, I will turn it over to Kevin Flynn to talk about the South Sheridan Corridor. Hello. I'm, there we go. 
Uh, my name is Kevin Flynn. Uh, welcome, everyone, and thank you for joining. I represent Southwest Denver on the Denver City Council. I was elected in 2015. One of the issues that we found uh, when uh, when I came into office was that there's this very um, uh, declining 64-acre uh, area we call the South Sheridan Commercial Corridor. I named it that. It really didn't have a name because, as you'll see, uh, it was a completely unorganized part of Denver. It was unplatted and it had been annexed while development had already started in the late 50s, annexed into Denver in uh, two pieces in the early 60s, uh, the south portion, which is to the left, the lower left of that map uh, first, and then a year later up to the north. And uh, so there were a few things in place, a gas station, a car wash, things like that. And uh, what we ended up with uh, was uh, uh, properties with parcel sizes ranging from 6,000 square feet all the way up to 13 acres. The 13 acres is part of what Denver calls planned building group. It's not a PUD, but it's, a, it's, a, it's an agreement uh, by the property owners to, uh, to uh, develop according to uh, certain restrictions that they're all covenanted to. And this 13-acre parcel is sort of center left, the big white rooftop there, and that opened as a target in uh, 1975. And it closed in 2011. And uh, it closed because in Lakewood, the Villa Italia Mall had been redeveloped into Belmar, and Target moved over to Belmar. They sold it in 2012 to a, a business person from Arizona who runs a business called 99 Cent, Super 99 Cent. And uh, all I heard during my initial campaign was how we have to do something with this old target. Uh, we have to do something with it. I looked around the, the area. Uh, I'm very familiar with it. My kids went to school in the little building in center bottom there, Notre Dame School. And I used to shop at that target. And so uh, I know that around it was not just the target, but... Uh, all these other parcels that were also in decline. We had uh, multiple ownerships, some of them out of state, uh, 33 parcels, 57 businesses on those parcels. Uh, here you can see the year of development of all the various parcels. And uh, so we had the target at 110,000 square feet. Hugh M. Woods was the brown rooftop there, sort of middle, upper middle. Uh, there was a Safeway supermarket. That's the white roof up there that says 1992. There was an indoor ice rink. That's the white roof that's uh, uh, at the left side, uh, on north of the target. And a bowling alley at the bottom left. And the little white roof at the bottom right was a twin movie theater. People loved this place. Uh, there was a garden store right in the middle of Elliott's Garden Center. Uh, a couple of restaurants, uh, Azar's Big Boy. I think uh, those of us who've been in Denver a while remember the Azar's Big Boy. Over the years, gradual decline, and none of these buildings is used for what it was originally built for other than the two restaurants that are still functioning. Uh, the indoor ice rink is uh, became a soccer facility, but now has been bought by a non-denominational church, and they use it for church services. The movie theater at the bottom right is also a, a church, and uh, the bowling alley at the bottom left is a, uh, a um, wholesale contractor supply store. The Safeway went vacant in about 2014, and um, we managed to get a tenant into there, not a tenant, but a new buyer, completely renovated by Vasa Fitness. This is their number one location in the Denver metro area now. It has just done gangbusters. And so as I uh, met with my constituents and said, what do we want? They said, we need better commercial. Uh, we need this to serve the neighborhood like it used to. We are tired of driving to uh, Lakewood or to Sheridan or to Englewood or to Littleton to, uh, to take our kids out for casual dining or to do shopping or, or just a sense of place. Southwest Denver has de developed uh, post-war in a very suburban context, and we don't have uh, we don't have centers. We don't have Union Station, uh, you know, the Great Hall there. We don't have a place where you can sit down and see your neighbors and linger. Uh, we'll wave to each other in the King Supers checkout line, and, and then we go home. 
And so people wanted a place where they could gather. I think that's what folks are looking for these days, uh, especially in the suburban context. So I put together a group of constituents, residents of the surrounding neighborhoods, and we called ourselves the South Sheridan Steering Committee. And so what we started doing was we... Uh, I brought in speakers. I brought in uh, Roger Pecksock from Continuum, which did Belmar, and told us how long and how difficult it was to do Belmar because a lot of my constituents said, this could be a little mini Belmar, couldn't it? And Roger soon uh, uh, you know, put the uh, uh, put a good dose of reality on top of my residence and said, no, 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 that's a very unlikely outcome. We brought in Tracy Huggins from the Denver Urban Renewal Authority to do a presentation on how urban renewal works, how tax increment financing works. We brought in, uh, at the time, uh, Brad Buchanan and Steve Nally, who were the director and the deputy director of community planning and development for Denver, who gave us the 101 on uh, on redevelopment tools. Uh, we brought in some developers, George Thorne from uh, I uh, can't think of George's firm right now, uh, but who's done uh, at the time was engaged in Regatta Plaza redevelopment with an old King Supers over on Parker Road at 225. And he gave us a good uh, education on how difficult it was to do that. So we educated ourselves, but we didn't know where to go. We didn't know how to put this education to work. We turned to, uh, I'm on the Dr. Cog board, I'm a Denver representative, and I saw the announcement for the uh, Dr. Cog uh, grant that would absorb one third of the cost of doing an Urban Land Institute technical advisory panel. Talked with a bunch of folks out in Portland when I went on one of the Denver Partnership uh, Urban Exploration trips to talk to Susan Powers. Uh, Tracy Huggins was there, a couple of developers, and they said, you need to hook up with ULI. I became familiar with ULI in the early 80s when they were brought in by Denver to assist with uh, uh, study of various locations for what became the Colorado Convention Center. We were looking at the rail yards uh, just to the north of Union Station. Can you imagine what Denver would be like today if we had put the convention center where we now have uh, the uh, all that $2 billion worth of private investment in the old rail yards and the RTD transit, uh, transit hub at Union Station. If instead there were a convention center there, the Golden Triangle was looked at. Finally, the, down, the downtown area where the uh, convention center eventually went. So uh, I entered the competitive process and was selected. Uh, I had co-sponsorship from our Office of Economic Development, and I was able to match the uh, uh, the um, uh, the grant from Dr. Cog out of my district office budget. We put together the uh, panel and we met in an event center on the site. I identified uh, categories of of uh, stakeholders that I wanted the five panelists to talk to. First of all, members of my steering committee who represented the uh, the breadth and the diversity of my constituents. Registered neighborhood organizations. In Denver, we have the system where you have official standing in city processes if you organize an RNO. And all the surrounding RNOs uh, sent their presidents or a representative. I had the faith community involved because we had some churches on the site. We have a church right across the street. Uh, we we had community ministry, which is a uh, religiously based uh, food bank and clothing bank that serves Southwest Denver. Uh, we had uh, Monsignor Buell from Notre Dame across the street. We also brought in the nonprofit uh, community. We had uh, uh, Mikasa Resource Center, uh, uh, their president attended. Then we had property owners and business owners. Uh, I can't tell you how difficult it was to reach all of them. Some of them are out of state. Many of them are are just completely uninvolved. Uh, their properties are vacant and they're in decline, and they many of them never even responded. We had some real estate developers on the panel. We had also Denver Economic Development and City Planning Office. And then we had CDOT, RTD, and Denver Public Works Transportation Division uh, representatives for representing transportation. Finally, a panel of all of the elected officials uh, that cover the area, as well as two Lakewood uh, city council members, because this area borders Lakewood, and uh, and I thought it was appropriate to have them. Uh, join. So we gave them a, our briefing book, uh, presented them with a problem statement that ended up with three questions. After going through all the education we did and how a 110,000 square foot target store was never going to be reoccupied by a $110,000 uh, 110, square foot retail tenant, what can we do? Is retail really realistic at this location? 
what tools did we have that could overcome the multiple ownerships, uh, sizes, configurations, because uh, land assemblage was going to be quite difficult here with the multiple owners and the, uh, the huge disparity in sizes of parcels and the lack of, of platting, and what Denver zoning code uh, classifications would be best suited to accomplish that. Afterward, the panel gave us uh, recommendations that I boiled down into these three areas. Retail, small, scary, small scale and experiential retail uh, is viable in, in, in their opinion. Uh, anything that Amazon can't deliver to the front porch, which I'm discovering through my wife, is, is kind of getting more and more limited each day. Uh, north of Evans, where the VASA came in, uh, we had the old garden store had become a, uh, a uh, hydroponic a greenhouse for salad greens and herbs for upscale Denver restaurants. It's a business called Rebel Farm, and uh, they have been quite successful. And so we had, and with the indoor soccer arena, uh, although it's now a church, we thought the north side of there really gave us a hint as to what was really popular here. Vasa was going gangbusters, and it looked like a health and fitness healthy lifestyles theme uh, would really work here. And so that's on the north side of Evans. South of Evans, where the Target, uh, the old Target store uh, sets, uh, there was a great opportunity starting with the 13 acres if we could take the perimeter properties and, and assemble a, co a contiguous developable parcel that that might be attractive for housing. And that goes to the second bullet there. Multifamily, uh, both rental and, uh, and for sale product, maybe a senior component an affordable housing component uh, would be would be uh, uh, the best approach. We also talked a little bit about having perhaps medical office suite because a lot of the medical offices that were built here in the post-war in the, up through the mid-50s, early 60s, they've moved out. And so when people go to medical appointments, they're usually leaving uh, this, this part of my district to go elsewhere. Uh, improvement to the public realm, pedestrian character would also uh, provide gr great amenities for the housing. Mobility, we talked about about uh, connecting this uh, 64 acres to the urban street grid. It's relatively flat. It lends itself to that. Perhaps a festival street included. Uh, a neighborhood mobility hub that would include uh, Lyft or Uber, uh, pickup and drop-off points, a secure bike storage. There are four RTD routes that converge here. Uh, RTD uh, has consolidated some bus stops in other areas. It would make a great uh, it would make a great hub here to consolidate the four routes and to time them so that you could transfer if needed. And then the sidewalks. Uh, the sidewalks are horrible, as you can see here on this slide. Uh, this is a sidewalk on Sheridan Boulevard by the old Hugh M. Wood store, which is now a uh, Mile High Thrift. It's now a thrift store for many many years. Um, I'm happy to say it always wins Best of Denver's in Westward, uh, Best of Denver's Best Thrift Store in Denver. But I'd love for that sidewalk to be uh, ADA compliant. Um, after the TAP, uh, the ULI selected the South Sheridan commercial area for the Real Estate Diversity Initiative class. Uh, this was just a great, uh, uh, a great next step for me because uh, here with the TAP, we started to push this boulder uphill, but we have to keep it going. We couldn't stop. I offered to pay the tuition for any uh, constituent from my district who was selected for the TAP. Uh, the Ready class focuses on, uh, on people of color and females who are underrepresented in the real estate development uh, industry or sector. And so we had a uh, 30, 30 folks who were divided into three uh, classes of 10 each, and they had mentors, and George Thorne was one of them, as I recall, and they took the uh, technical advisory panel recommendations, they came out and toured the facility, I presented to them, and they came up with three pretty different uh, scenarios for development, and now this was just for them, it was, these are not real, uh, rec uh, not real projects, uh, none of this, you know, there was no money behind it or anything, but they did did look into how they could be financed. They were realistic. And so then we started circulating them around the, uh, uh, around the development community. Uh, we also then, uh, I worked with uh, our economic development office to fund a uh, about $30,000 market analysis by a consultant, uh, Puma, Progressive Urban Management Associates. 
And so they have finished their study. I'm about, and actually this afternoon, I'm going to send it out to my steering committee. And among their recommendations uh, is to uh, transition the South Sheridan, South Sheridan Steering Committee into a broader stakeholder group because we absolutely have to have property owners uh, as part of this process. And uh, we have started to interview uh, some of them, uh, the consultant team and, and, and me in my office here. And uh, we're starting to spread that market analysis around to interested parties and uh, then identify the remaining obstacles, such as zoning. As you can see on the map here, the gray area at the bottom where the target is, that's the 13 acres plus some of the surrounding uh, properties that are in the planned building group. We have already talked to uh, Sorry, we have already talked to uh, some brokers who are signing up property owners to try to put an assembly together. And so it feels to me like that going through uh, the Dr. Cog uh, grant process and bringing ULI in here has helped us get this boulder halfway up of a, halfway up the hill and that we're pretty well positioned for uh, uh, looking forward to transform this property, uh, this area into uh, uh, the next uh, the next version of what it wants to be. People have to realize it's never going to be what it used to be, but it can be something great. And uh, the work has really just begun. Thank you. Hi there, this is uh, Sam Bishop. I'm the Community Development Director uh, for the City of Castle Pines. I'm excited to share the city's TAP experience. Um, Castle Pines was incorporated in 2008, so we are uh, Colorado's newest community. We're approximately 20 miles south of Denver, um, in between Lone Tree and Castle Rock. Our current population is about 12,000. We anticipate a uh, build out of close to 35,000. And we currently experience higher than average household incomes, uh, which means uh, there is some discretionary income within the community. Uh, but we also know that we experience a lot of leakage for those folks as far as where they go to spend quality time and their money. Um, again, just a little bit of demographics about Castle Pines to provide a little bit better picture. Our current uh, median age is 42 years old, so uh, we don't have a lot of first time home buyers in Castle Pines currently. Um, and we know as these folks age, their preferences start to shift on how they want to enjoy their free time and how they spend their money. So with that, I'll go ahead and uh, jump in here. So as far as what prompted the TAP for the city, um, at the time of incorporation, we really had one area of commerce. We referred to it as the city's business district. I know that sounds pretty sterile. Um, that's borrowed from the underlying zoning uh, name. So this area really does serve as the lifeblood for the community. It's, it's the only area to really shop, um, it's, which means it's the city's only uh, source of sales tax, which is important because we don't have a property tax to support city services. So this area obviously was very important for the community. Uh, prior to incorporation, um, you know, this area probably it didn't matter as much. Um, Castle Pines historically has been a bedroom community to Denver and Denver Tech Center. Um, so people didn't really uh, consider, you know, spending a lot of time or money uh, within this area. But now that we're a city, it's obviously important uh, for us. So um, since day one, we've, we've kind of realized uh, what some of the issues are within our uh, business districts. We have higher vacancy rates, high property taxes, um, a lack of interest from some of the ownership groups within the area, um, really a lack of overall just organization from within the district as far as how the uh, business and property owners organize themselves. Um, as Arlene uh, mentioned earlier, we have a, um, a dated physical layout of the area, um, an inadequacy for infrastructure and amenities, and I think most importantly, there's really no sense of place for folks to gather. So I would imagine a lot of folks on this call, if you have a shopping area center that was developed in the 90s, 80s, you're probably experiencing some of the same issues. And then I think just bigger concerns were, you know, in this time, you know, what are we doing in the face of this um, changing retail environment? Uh, we obviously have a, a need to retain existing businesses and, and help those folks grow while it's trying to attract uh, new opportunities. And then we've also talked about 
um, you know, I guess, uh, regional competition, what that looks like. Um, again, we're between Lone Tree and Castle Rock. So Lone Tree is home to Park Meadows Mall. Um, I think they actually advertise that as a retail resort. Um, Castle, Rock ha Castle Rock has a lot of um, outlet stores, big box retail. So Castle Pines isn't going to com compete in those arenas. And um, so we need to be something different. And over the years, we've had multiple failed attempts on how to address some of these issues. So we found real value in partnering with uh, Dr. Cog and ULI, and uh, we had a, a great experience in the TAP panel. So I'll go ahead and um, jump into that, our experience. So this was the, I guess, the problem statement. Uh, this was really kind of the city scope, what we wanted to address through the process. Um, I guess I think it boils down to the area that's highlighted. We wanted to identify what some of the economic challenges uh, are um, within the business district. And then we also wanted to come up with some short and long-term strategies to, again, kind of a, retain and attract new businesses and development or redevelopment opportunities. This is an aerial of our business district. Um, it's roughly 125 acres in size. Um, by all accounts, it should be walkable um, as far as the size, um, but it's not currently for a number of reasons, and we'll get into to some of those. So when the TAC panelists came to town um, as part of their uh, research, they did you know, do some uh, prior studying of our plans and reports to get a better understanding of Castle Pines, but they conducted a, a series of on-site interviews. Uh, those were really helpful, and I think you know the, the findings over on the left they were really kind of the building blocks for how they were going to address some of these issues, just taking those really into account. Um, so, you know, just looking at this, it doesn't probably take long to any, I guess, land use professional to figure out that, you know, what, what these issues are. We have two areas that are um, kind of the traditional big box with the inline retail. Um, they were at least thought of maybe started getting developed in the 90s. And they're, they're really just out of date. Um, there's no real connectivity between the areas. Um, it was obviously designed independent of each other. Um, it was designed for the automobile. It's not pedestrian friendly. Uh, we have a lot of mom and pop businesses uh, with the exception of the um, grocery stores themselves. And we don't tax groceries here in Castle Pine. So another reason for us to uh, figure out um, how we start to generate some additional sales tax as well. So once the TAP panelists actually came um, into town, uh, they, they did the site visit. Um, again, walked around, got a better understanding. And I think to start to quantify some of these um, issues and how to address them, we came up with these kind of larger categories um, to start to be the basis for these recommendations. Um, those three being fostering community and creating a sense of place, intentional development and redevelopment and then financial resiliency and vitality. So this is what, you know, I think these categories really fit what Castle Pines was attempting to address. Um, my next slides go into what the recommendations were and, and what we've done to date to address those. Um, the report that was presented to us goes into much more uh, detail, but I think for the sake of this webinar, I'm gonna be somewhat brief. So. Um, again, I'll go over these three categories. So one of the recommendations was to foster a community and a sense of place. So these images were from the report. So the upper left image is um, an aerial of our current business district. Um, we have vacant parcels. Every building has um, its individual parking requirements. The streets are overly wide for no apparent reason. Um, again, there's no real connectivity um, as far as building design um, between the sites. So um, the folks at ULI came in, um, they kind of re-envisioned, re-imagined what this area could be. Um, they provided some incredible um, images, uh, not only for the city staff and elected officials, but also, you know, these are easily understood by the general community that we're able to share these with. So um, this was just one of the areas that they talked about um, being able to foster community and creating a sense of place. They did evaluate the larger area, but again, I think I'm just, um, for the sake of brevity, using this as an example. So to date, um, this is what we've done to really address that. I, we don't have any physical developments that, that shows, you know, we've been able to locate a little main ice cream down here and we've been able to, you know, reimagine and reconfigure the roadway design. But um, what, what we've done um, to help, 
you know, envision that design ultimately is we've adopted design guidelines um, prior to the TAP panel being here. We didn't have any design guidelines. So that's really going to lay the groundwork for when future development does come in. We're going to ensure that, you know, some of the, at least the building design um, orientation, public spaces, and materials uh, look somewhat unified. Um, we've adopted a new logo for the city. Um, again, we, we talked about branding the city, so this has been really important. And uh, we're working on amending our business zone district regulations. Um, we obviously find that, I guess, the biggest bang for our buck here is going to be new zoning regulations. Uh, so we're working with a, a company called ENCODE Plus to really just host those. Um, we, we are able to edit from multiple sites if I use consultants to help with those. So uh, we are in the process of rewriting our business zone district uh, regulations to help implement that vision. And then lastly on this slide is a, um, a mock-up of uh, our gateway and branding efforts that we just recently wrapped up. And it, it evaluated the, the city sign program for the entire city. This is um, an image of the bridge over I-25. It's hard to imagine without a traffic, um, the traffic going under there. But um, this is something that we financed for this year to start implementing. And we anticipate actually completing the bridge improvements over I-25 within the next couple of years. And then as far as intentional development and redevelopment, this was another category. Um, again, Arlene kind of showed one of these areas, but um, they were able to uh, take, a, I guess, an overview of the area and really start to break it down, make it quantifiable as far as what are the current businesses, square footages, land uses, how do we diversify those, how do we build on um, some of the assets in the, in the immediate area, immediate area, and then and what do we need to do to help, you know, revitalize and potentially redevelop some certain areas. So, I think what initially stood out was the fact that it was a really service-based type of an area. Um, there's a lot of hair salons, nail salons, dry cleaners. Um, it meets the community's service needs, but it doesn't meet their other needs as far as recreation dining, entertainment, um, so we have some images about, you know, what we can aspire to a be, uh, be or attract. Um, the, the image in the upper right, or on the right-hand side, it says Castle Pines. Um, it should be on the next slide. This is what we've actually done to help, you know, start to implement um, some change within the area. We've, we've been successful in um, providing some publications uh, within nationally distributed uh, nationally distributed uh, real estate publications. And again, it's just an effort to um, get our name out there. And in this slide, this is what we've kind of been working towards as far as intentional development and redevelopment. Um, this is probably what I'm most excited about. Um, this is a kind of a visual representation of what our business district could be um, if redeveloped. So this really took the work that ULI did and we built on that. So I'm working with a group right now um, again, to figure out what this area can look like being kind of re redesigned, re-envisioned. Um, and then this is, these are going to be, uh, this is, I would consider to be a, a real world activity for lack of a better term. Um, these are actually square footages, um, the parking ratios we're able to quantify and work out. Uh, we've also been successful in conducting uh, quarterly business meetings with a lot of the business owners. Um, that's been important for us to understand, get a better understanding of what some of their uh, issues are uh, within our business district. And then we've also had um, separate meetings with uh, property owners. So, and then in the lower right, um, we have uh, been successful in attracting one national brand name to Castle Pines, which is the cycle bar. So we're excited about that. As far as uh, fiscal resiliency and vitality, um, this was a list of recommendations um, that was offered up by the, the TAP panel. And my next slide really just says that, you know, we've actually done a pretty good job of addressing some of these. I wouldn't say that we've addressed some of these things in their entirety. So for an example, we haven't actually hired an economic development professional for the city, but what we have done is hire some additional staff within the city. And we've been able to take existing staff and utilize their professional resources and dedicate a little bit more time towards that effort. Um, we have transitioned from a statutory municipality to a home rule municipality um, this last November. Uh, so uh, we've been able to capture and increase on some internet sales tax, which has been beneficial 
for us. So, you know, the, anytime you have more money, it, it helps us out. We can obviously reinvest that money in the future. Um, if, if the policy supports that into our business district uh, this year, like I said, we're going to work really on our, our gateway and branding efforts, which does tie into uh, some of the recommendations. And then the, the last one here is it refers to a specific development within the community. It's, it's a large piece of property within the city that's just beginning to develop on the east side of I-25. Um, it was probably um, underutilized as far as some of the density that the property could support. Um, we've been successful in, in actually doubling the density since the CAT panel was here two years ago. So it just exists on paper. It's starting to get developed currently, but we anticipate those folks that move in there, obviously they'll, they'll be nearby and want to spend some quality time within our uh, business district. So um, going into the process, um, the, the TAP panel or ULI specifically wanted to know a short list of questions from the city. What, 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 what are your concerns? What are the issues and how best can we um, address those? And they've provided answers here. So the bold is what the questions were. And I think Mary Ann said this really well. Um, you know, when cities engage ULI, um, these weren't, these weren't questions that we didn't know the answers to, I think internally. Uh, but it was really important for the community to hear this from a, kind of an independent third party um, professional organization. And I think some of these answers, again, the, the report builds on, you know, what some of these answers are. But I think um, they're in layman's terms. You know, I can I can meet with a resident and say this is what we're working on. And these are some of the responses and it's, it's easily understood. And then lastly, this was a, a, a similar or the same slide that um, Arlene shared, um, and this is kind of where we are, and I think in the reality of where we are, we've you know we've been able to start to address some of the zoning issues within this area. You know, we've adopted an economic development plan that starts to look at how the city can either partner or incentivize or potentially uh, form an urban renewal authority or help you know get a, a, a downtown development authority formed. Uh, so I think we're just a little bit. We're better educated than we were a couple years ago and then this is kind of where we are right now we have you know we started directing um, developers um, to the direction of some of these property owners to see if there's a, really a deal to be had and then i think the next step is going to be for us to you know financially participate you know to to make this a reality and we're probably still a couple years out um, again i don't have any um, real images to, to share that you know say that shows that you know, new developments occurring, but I think since ULI has been to town, we've continued to work and build up, you know, our policy plans and uh, reports to support, you know, that, that future development occurring. So uh, with that, thank you. Good afternoon. This is Malcolm Fleming, the town administrator in Erie. Uh, thanks for joining us this afternoon. So when we were thinking about what's going on in Erie, uh, we tapped ULI to come to town for a number of reasons. We've got, uh, if you don't know, Erie is uh, north of Denver and east of Boulder. We're a fast growing community, suburban community of about 30,000 people right now. Uh, and we have a prime undeveloped site in the center of town, about 120 acres just to the west of our historic downtown. There are five different property owners in that area. Each had uncoordinated development plans in various stages of review and approval. We wanted uh, some alternatives to what they were proposing and uh, clearly alternatives to the traditional suburban development model that were being proposed in other areas around town. So we decided to seek some outside expertise through the TAP and uh, see if we could get that to help both the community and staff and elected officials see a potentially different path for this special area in town. We also really wanted to get a realistic assessment of the market potential in Erie and on this site in particular and use that to help jumpstart some commercial recruitment efforts that we're working on. So and for all of these reasons, the TAP seemed like a really cost-effective way to get a fast-track approach to a cohesive plan. 
Here's a diagram showing the rough area on the very northern uh, upper part of the illustration is where our historic downtown occurs. Uh, you can see ball fields that are adjacent to our community center. We list four different individual uh, parcels that are owned by different developers. And to the north of parcel number one is a fifth uh, property owner that we also include in the site. Uh, let's see, go in the right direction here. To kick things off with the TAP, we asked them to address a number of specific inquest questions, including how much and where is commercial viable in this area of town? How could we coordinate development despite having the multiple ownerships in the area? And how could we achieve a vision without delays? Because a number of the projects we wanted to go forward very quickly and we didn't want to stop them uh, by doing a long, uh, very detailed master planning exercise or comprehensive planning exercise. So we wanted to work with the developers and get them involved in the process. We wanted to do it in a way that would support development in this town center area without just sucking uh, development out of the town's historic downtown, which has really uh, had a number of new development projects happening. So we wanted to keep that going in the historic area while also uh, getting things moving in, in the town center. And finally, we wanted to foster, a, again, a different alternative to the traditional suburban development and have a much more walkable design with a unique sense of place and really strong economic vitality. Um, the TAP members came in and, and in a short period of time did a great job. Uh, among their observations were a market analysis that showed that there was some potential for the area uh, for commercial development in the town center. They projected that it was roughly 12,000 square feet of grocery. There was a lot more uh, demand for restaurant in the area. They suggested focusing on a smaller format grocery store. Fortunately, we weren't uh, far along uh, in recruiting luckies to come. Uh, we're working on others. So uh, anybody who's been following the news uh, knows that that would have been a, a, a disaster if we'd actually gotten them to come to town. Um, among their other findings were something we really knew from the start. Erie, most people are leaving town to work either in Boulder or Denver or Longmont or Fort Collins. So uh, we've really got to work on, on bringing primary employment opportunities to town. And that was perfect to uh, target for uh, this town center area along with retail and other commercial. Um, among the placemaking uh, suggestions the TAP had were to take advantage of the connections with the old town uh, to really capture the traffic that's going through the area on Erie Parkway in the east and west direction and north and south on County Line Road and to uh, bring a cohesive center to this area, which is obviously one of the things we wanna do. Uh, they also suggested taking advantage of the trail connections that we have to the adjacent residential centers to really build on the community connection with the community center that's right uh, adjacent to this uh, intersection. We've got uh, uh, thousands of people coming to the community center every day. It's also the uh, regional library site. Uh, and a major intersection in town. So we, we think we can bring connections uh, as a result of all of those activities. Uh, the TAP provided some good illustrations of placemaking concepts that attract people, and we were able to use those in the subsequent design uh, development that we've uh, engaged in since then. The TAP occurred, uh, unlike some of the others that we've been talking about today uh, that were years ago, this one just happened last July, uh, not even six months ago, uh, or just six months ago. Immediately after that, we issued a request for proposals for a more detailed market analysis of the area and a master plan development. We contracted with DPZ co-design, Andreas Duaney and Elizabeth Pleiter-Zybeck's firm, 
they came to town and did a very intensive seven-day design charrette uh, where we involved hundreds of people, uh, all of the developers, all of the uh, adjacent uh, community living around uh, the town center, uh, each of the board of trustees, elected officials, and uh, it was a fantastic, really quick process to, to bring people in. Uh, they started off with conceptual design they presented and in real time people were able to react to those uh, and and uh, the design team made changes all through the charrette process reflecting people's contributions so not only did we get uh, good ideas uh, but there was also a sense of buy-in from the entire community because they were able to voice their concerns and perceptions about things and see those reflected in the ultimate plans. Again, I mentioned that we had a, a detailed market analysis done uh, that identified there is, uh, because most of the commercial development happens on the periphery of Erie, uh, there's a strong demand at this particular site to pull some of that from the sur surrounding areas and really concentrate it in the center of town. People have an alternative to, to walk or drive a much shorter distance to this location, they're much more likely to do that. So this more detailed market analysis identified that there was really um, almost $50 million a year in unmet grocery demand, restaurant demand, and, and others. So it was, it was good to dive deeper as a result of the TAPS recommendations, and, and we conducted that as part of the uh, more detailed master planning exercise. So here's a slide that shows the illustrative master plan that was developed by DPZ as a result of that design charrette with the community. Uh, it really uh, resulted in this innovative peel concept off of the uh, uh, county line road intersection uh, to create more of a main street style uh, development that commercial could happen on both sides. We had challenges with the site in uh, um, old mining, uh, undermining on the east side of County Line Road. And so uh, trying to create that sense of room on both sides of the street was going to be impossible. So as a result of that, they came up with the innovative peel design that sort of brings traffic into the center, creates more of a, a Main Street type development and will allow commercial to go on both sides. Illustration shows the central market area that we uh, are, are working on recruiting commercial to come to that area now. Uh, this next slide shows uh, a, a more uh, flex industrial area uh, to the south uh, of the intersection. And uh, all of these uh, illustrations, again, have broad community support uh, that uh, we are actively working on developing the implementing regulations. The Board of Trustees approved the, the illustrative master plan in principle, and based on that, we are working with DPZ and the development community to uh, finalize the implementing regulations. We're taking those to the town's planning commission in early March and hope to have the Board of Trustees uh, take final action on those implementing regulations uh, shortly after that in March. We've also, as a result of this effort, uh, have uh, three different uh, development proposals coming in uh, for neighborhood community on the eastern side and commercial development along Erie Parkway. Uh, and once we get the implementing regulations done, we're certain that we'll be able to actively recruit other parties to come to the table. So it's been a great exercise in getting things going and uh, enabling us to fast track uh, development in a much different, more walkable community centered plan than would have been happening if we had just left it up to responding to the development proposals. And with that, I'll turn it back over to Marianne or whomever else from ULI is going to lead the Q&A. Well, thank you. Thank you to all of our speakers for talking about um, the process that you went through in your community. 
Um, and just so everyone knows, I put my contact information and a link to where you can find out more about TAPS, including all the TAP reports that were mentioned today um, in the chat. So if you look at chat, you can find um, those links. And then if you go to handouts, you can find the RFA to apply for Dr. Cog matching funding for a TAP. And you can also find the slides from today's presentation. Um, does anyone have any questions? Um, we've got questions. A couple questions have come in uh, since registration and since we started talking. Um, I encourage anyone uh, to use the question panel uh, through GoToWebinar to ask us more questions. But I thought I'd just get us started with um, the first one uh, that came in during registration about um, economic impact statements. Uh, it is: Do economic impact statements provide valuable insight? And I'm not sure. Who might be able to answer this question, but it might please respond in the context of this work if that's more appropriate. I'll jump in on that one. Uh, this is Malcolm Fleming. I'm not sure in terms of an economic impact statement, but certainly uh, the TAP's expertise in helping identify a preliminary potential economic impact and demand for the uh, for commercial and retail ac activity in the area was extremely helpful for us. It, it started things off and I said in, in my presentation uh, influenced us to go to a much more detailed and comprehensive market analysis to help inform how much commercial was viable in the area and uh, we can use that both to influence the commercial development and uh, recruit new uh, development to the area. Uh, this is Kevin Flynn. Uh, let me just add to that that in the case of the South Sherry, probably would not have been, uh, economic impact statement would not have been a, a very useful tool in the beginning because of the complete lack of any cohesive uh, project ideas or or entities to pursue a project in our case. Uh, we viewed our process more as a very slow, progressive, and iterative process, and when we get, uh, if this current effort with the old target site, uh, if they can put an assembly together and have a project, then uh, an economic impact statement would be very appropriate. All right, sounds good. So we did have one come in um, on the question panel. I'll just read it here for the panel. Um, it says, my community is having issues uh, with redevelopment, uh, but we are about 4,000 people and unincorporated. Uh, is the TAP process appropriate for such a small area, or do you have other means to help the community understand uh, the realities of redevelopment? Uh, we have great transit access, but it is currently underutilized. Uh, Mary Ann, maybe I can just get started. I think we would need to have a little more information about what's going on in terms of background, but um, certainly I can. Um, so where the cat fits in, it's kind of you know it's not the that, that sort of answers all your questions up front, but it's intended to be strategic, and it's intended to help guide you in terms of what your next steps might be. And so, um, you know, I, I can see the situation. There are TAPs that are in smaller communities where it's been very appropriate. Um, I just think that, you know, it sounds like maybe a little more information would be helpful in order to help determine whether a TAP would be appropriate. Maybe that's a good I agree. Yeah, maybe that's a good opportunity. Uh, go ahead, Marianne. Sorry. I was just going to say I agree. Um, this is very similar to the types of problem statements that we get. Um, for most of our TAPs. And then what we do is we just work with you to um, get more specific about what you would want the panelists to, to address. And that's why we have those specific questions for each TAP. Um, so you can kind of break it down into um, a study area that they can focus on and then a problem statement and then very specific questions that you want them to answer. And sometimes they'll go beyond those questions and um, do some sort of market analysis or come up with a strategic blueprint for how to move forward. Um, each tap is different, but it does sound like this is the kind of thing that we, we normally work on. Andy, did you want to say something? Um, no, I think uh, uh, 
the example with um, recent example with Evergreen was a, a tap that uh, we helped support at Dr. Cog that was in an unincorporated community. So by no means is it a prerequisite that you be an incorporated place uh, to try and take advantage of these services. Well, we're not seeing any additional questions uh, at this time. I think I've got one that came in via email. Um, and I, I think some of it has to do with older adults and uh, uh, how can uh, these areas be a potential place uh, where we can meet some of the demand that older people have to live out their lives and um, uh, uh, die with dignity. See, I'll jump in on that one. Uh, Malcolm from Erie, as part of the development analysis, it identified how to make a much more walkable community and a diversified community that has housing product for everyone throughout their life cycle, young families, uh, seniors, millennials, uh, and combining that into a plan uh, that, that covers all of those different age groups. So I think that's one of the things I don't know if the, the TAP addressed it specifically, but the follow-up work that we did based on the TAP uh, certainly identified that as, as a need in this area and, um, and quantified the demand for the different types of housing. Uh, this is Kevin Flynn again on South Sheridan. Uh, both the TAP and the Ready classes that uh, that followed up on the TAP uh, identified uh, uh, potential for senior living facilities combined with, as they as they um, made very important, the healthy living, healthy lifestyles, including medical office buildings. Um, the surrounding neighborhoods are all post-war, mid fifties to early sixties, and there are a significant number. I have found uh, original homes owners who are in their late 80s and early 90s who are having difficulty maintaining their houses but would like to stay in their neighborhood. So uh, I think this helped us identify an opportunity for uh, mixed income and multi-generational housing on the site as we add those amenities that, uh, that Malcolm just spoke about with the walkability and the services nearby, uh, allowing seniors to age in place in their neighborhoods. And um, I just want to add that you know, a lot of the issues we're talking about in terms of creating a community center and possible areas and amenities and services, um, obviously these are the types of things that people of all ages it, people of all ages want. It's not just a particular, it's not just a millennial group or it's not just, you know, people that have certain jobs. It's really something that, that we can see that a majority of people want. All right, uh, we've got a couple more questions coming in. Uh, is there a scope that works better for a TAP? Uh, is a single site better, or would it work also for a commercial corridor? Um, so that's a great question. Um, each TAP that we do has a different scope, but um, we always want to draw boundaries around, OK, what are we, exactly are we studying? We've done it from you know, a single site to a district to city boundaries to a commercial quarter. We've done all of those types. So um, obviously the more specific you can get, um, then the more detail you'll get on that specific site. But if you feel like you need it to be a broader area, then we can work with you on that. Um, yeah, so I, I don't see there being, um, you know, boundaries in terms of like what Size we would be willing to take. Um, we can we can also work with you if you have questions about your area, um, and we can kind of work with you to hone in on what makes the most sense. All right. So um, I, this question I think is for uh, Kevin Flynn regarding the South Sheridan uh, Boulevard uh, area. Uh, what was the nature of transit service and considerations to provide improved connections to the neighborhoods uh, north and south of this redevelopment area along Sheridan Boulevard uh, to potentially, uh, was there any look at potentially reducing the need for vehicle parking uh, at the site that was looked at? 
Mm -hmm. uh, well, there are four RTD uh, bus routes right now. Uh, uh, we would love to see a more frequent service, of course. Uh, the Sheridan Boulevard frequency is pretty good. The east-west connectivity in from the west side of Denver, east-west connectivity via transit has always been an issue because of the uh, main lines of the railroads, the Platte River and I-25, uh, you know, preventing all but a few opportunities to get across. So we have the Route 4, we have the Route uh, 21, the Evans uh, Crosstown. Uh, the suggestion to consolidate them at a mobility hub in the site while making pedestrian improvements and connecting to the street grid, mostly to the east, uh, is uh, was the recommendation. It's limited, though, because this annexation was one of the first that the city made into Jefferson County. Uh, it might have been the first, actually. And uh, as such, on the west side, none of the streets from the Denver neighborhood connect into what's now Lakewood. It used to be unincorporated Jefferson County from uh, from my neighborhood. It's called Green Meadows, the residential area to the west of it. To the north uh, is Lakewood also, uh, north of Jewel. And the Sanderson Gulch passes through there, and it's already developed. So there really is no urban grid to the north. To the south, it's a little, little more connected. On Depew Street, you can get through to the Lakewood neighborhood of Thraymore. Uh, but you quickly have to exit on the, on to, back onto Sheridan. It's really, as I described it in the briefing book, it's a thumb of Denver that sticks out with very little connectivity and even opportunity for connectivity anymore. Uh, Harlan Street is the west edge, and it dead ends both at the north and south, and it doesn't penetrate into Lakewood. Well, I'm not seeing any more questions popping up at the moment. Um, I'm curious uh, if the presenters have anything they'd like to add, uh, seeing some of the other slides, some of the other material that was presented, any questions you might have for each other. Um, well, I'm, I'm just so excited to have heard from all of you again on, on the work, the great work that you've been doing since the TAPS. Um, it's always a pleasure to, to stay in touch over time, and um, please let us know if we can help with anything. Also, I just want to reiterate, um, you guys are welcome to reach out to me. I put my contact information in the chat. Um, it's also on the RFA, which is in the handout section. Um, I'd love to hear from you guys. If, even if you're not sure if you want to do a TAP, um, you feel free to reach out to me, and we can talk through it to see, um, you know, what sort, you know, how we can help or... You know, if you want to apply for a TAP, that's great. If there's other opportunities, that's great too. Um, Kevin Flynn mentioned our real estate diversity initiative. Um, those applications for that program that we run um, for women and people of color to learn about development, applications open in May. Um, you're also welcome to reach out to me about that program. Um, I run that as well. So, um, yeah, if, does anyone else have any final words? Taps are great. Do one in your community. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, uh, Marianne, this is Kevin. I, I think this is the first opportunity you have actually had to hear about the follow-up we've been doing uh, through Puma and uh, with our economic development office and now with a broker uh, who is recruiting and actually has signed up some of the uh, parcels uh, to represent them for an assembly. So it's exciting. This I don't think this would have happened without that igniter at the very beginning of putting the tap together. So thank you to ULI and Dr. Cog. You guys, that's exciting. Yeah, this is Sam. I, I guess I would just say, you know, we appreciate uh, ULI and Dr. Cog's support for this. And we're just two years out from this, but we've got some good momentum based on uh, a lot of the recommendations. So thank you. Well, I want to thank everyone for their time uh, participating as panelists or, or listening in or, or asking questions. Um, we will be um, posting the this, this slides on the Dr. Cog website for download. Uh, we will also work to get the video uh, of this presentation up on our website as well. So if you want to share it with anyone who you think should uh, look at this and maybe evaluate if uh, TAPS are an opportunity now or in the future, um, this could be a great resource to share, um, and we'll be sending that back out as well. 
um, to anyone who registered, just a link to uh, where those resources can be found. So um, without seeing any other questions at the moment, I think we can end uh, just a little bit early. Um, so um, I just want to reiterate again, thank you everyone for your time and participation. We really appreciate it. Thank you, Andy. And, and somebody just asked about AICP credits, which you had on one of your opening slides. So I guess that'll be also on your follow-up email um, for people who yes. are reading this evening. Uh, yes, AICP credits are available. Um, if you download the slides uh, now uh, through GoToWebinar, you can find the early slide that had the number to search for since uh, their, their website, it can be hard to find the exact uh, class. Uh, or a workshop, but it is available. It is active in uh, APA system, um, and, or feel free to reach out to mvie at drcog.org with any questions about anything like that. Perfect. Thank Excellent. you so much for hosting us, Andy. Yes, thank you very much for helping so much, and uh, thank you to all the panelists. Uh, have a good afternoon. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.